Avoid cardio until it's necessary. Oh, there you go. Save that tool. First of all, it's a short-lived tool. Okay, lots of cardio to get really shredded doesn't work very. In fact, a lot of people get shredded in spite of the fact that doing just tons of cardio for twelve weeks or whatever. Save it. Do everything with diet and strength training, and then the last couple weeks, if you want to throw it in, you can, and you can squeeze off a little bit of body fat. But if you make this part of your long-term routine. What you're doing is you're countering that muscle building signal that we're trying to do with strength training through this, I need endurance uh, type of a signal, which really only encourages the muscle pare down process. So what you want to do is you want to save it until absolutely. And I remember you, Adam, when you competed, I think you did it the last two weeks. Yeah. Was it? The longest I've ever done cardio is four weeks. And most often it was two. So it, it's, uh, if you have a coach and they have you doing cardio for 12 weeks leading into a show, you should fire your coach. All right. You're all here because you want to get super shredded. We're going to get to the episode in just a second. But first, I'm going to give away a program. MAPS Powerlift. Okay. That's the program I'm giving away in today's episode. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to MAPS Powerlift. One more thing. We're running a sale right now on a MAPS program bundle and on a MAPS program. Okay, so an individual program and a bundle of programs. Here's what they are. The bundle is called the Shredded Summer Bundle. This is MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit, uh, MAPS Prime, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, all those things discounted, and then we took an additional 50% off. The individual program that's on sale is MAPS Hit. Hit, of course, is high-intensity interval training. That program by itself is 50% off. So if you're interested... Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code June50 for that 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. Sal, you uh, you were doing something. We were getting ready um, to start podcasting the other day, and I saw you eating in the front, and I've watched you over the last like few months. You, you're in some of the best shape you've ever been. You're getting ready to get shredded right now because you're getting ready to sh shoot uh, some video. And I got to thinking, you know what? Like, you know, you were you were talking about the the level that you're at right now as far as where you're at in the diet, mm. and I'm like, you know, this would be a really I hope cool episode or people will appreciate because there is a difference uh, with kind of getting in shape and being healthy and even losing some body fat and then taking it to an extreme oh, level yeah. of single digit single digit body fat. Yes. So there's there's some different rules that apply, and I think there's just a different mindset that you have to have to take it to where you're kind of going right now and. It's Been very different. It's very different. Like being lean is healthy. Being shredded is not. So it's a different mindset. It's a different approach. Of course, there's a, there's a genetic variance. Uh, some people could be much leaner than other people and still maintain good health. But um, what you have to do, at least for me, and I can be very specific because as an individual, I can give you more, more exact numbers. But what you have to do to get lean and what you have to do to get shredded or get down to single digit body fat for a man and for women, it's typically the low teens or, you know, maybe 10% even it's a, it's a, it's a, so psychologically different and it feels so different, um, that, uh, it warrants a, uh, an episode. I think, yeah. I think you're right. Well, you've been going now for you know, a while now, really consistent. That's probably the most consistent I've seen you on diet and training for a while. You've yeah. been, you've been in great shape. At what point did that did you start to notice it? Because you obviously, like, again, you're in good shape right now, but I know you made the mental switch, like, okay, I'm going to get really shredded yeah. for this this video shoot that we're going to do. What, when did that kind of tip you, like, oh, man, I forgot, you know, like, what it's like to go here? Yeah, I've been below, like, 7% body fat a couple times before, and each time I remember, it's like, for me, once I hit about, I want to say 8%, then it starts to feel kind of different. And, mm -hmm. and I noticed that my hot and cold tolerance change. So like I'll, I'll sweat, you know, sometimes, sometimes I'm cold. So it kind of throws it off. My sleep is a little different. The cravings are a whole nother level. So, and, and I remember this from before, like the leaner I get, like the closer I get down to five or 4% even, I'll start to have dreams about food. Yeah. It's like really weird, right? <laughs> You remember those? I do. I did. I have never in my life. Yeah, when you dream dreamt about, about food, food <laughs> yeah. until until I dieted that hard, and right? it's like I'm dreaming about like fruit. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, Anything. Yeah, like yeah. just so weird, right? Um, it's it's unhealthy psychologically and physically, for especially for long periods of time because it's um it's there's you know consistency is great, obsession not so much. But when you get to this, when you're getting to this type of level, you have to be obsessive about it well, because it's so. We we don't talk about this a lot because I think that we highlight that it's it's not a healthy place for most people yeah. to be. That being said, 
do you recognize that there are some positive oh healthy absolutely. benefits from pushing yourself to that extreme yeah i mean if you go into it the right mindset um because i don't think it's great for everybody but i think when you do it and you've talked about this too you really figure things out you really you become more in tune with your body you know how it reacts to certain things and when you do a certain level of of hard or challenge then the easier levels feel much easier right so like maintaining 10 percent body fat which is good lean for a man, I mean, you have kind of visible abs and you can maintain that in a healthy way with good consistency. That becomes a lot easier when you've played the game of getting down to 5% body fat, yeah. which is like a whole nother ball game. What do you, do you think that, is it like, is it almost like you, this, like your, your muscles and your receptors, like they, they're just so oversaturated with food and calories yeah. and the overconsumption that most of us do. And you're just wring everything out. And so you're like, ultra sensitive what is it that you think that makes us become so in tune when you when you get down that low yeah that's a good question you know what it is um i remember when you were competing you would talk about this too if you go from like if you're a guy and let's say you're sitting at 12 percent body fat which is a good athletic body fat percentage like you're not shredded you're lean you're fit you probably have good strength good performance like 12 to 15 percent is a good athletic body fat percentage some people can carry leaner but that's pretty good if you go from 12 to 13 percent you can't tell, like you, you can't tell in the mirror, right? You go from five to 6% is a big difference yeah. because that 1% is 5% of your body fat, right? right? So I think the changes are so visible. Like I can tell from day to day if I do one thing that's a little different just by the way I look and feel versus before where, you know, if I have a burger, that's not going to show up. doesn't make that big. Now, if I go off a little bit, I could tell. Uh, you know, and so it just makes you very sensitive, I think. Yeah, I think it makes you sensitive to the things that you can see visually and then also and how, how, and how you feel. Yeah. Like that was a, something that surprised me that I, I wasn't anticipating going into it um, is that I would, once I started getting down to the low single digits, I would eat a meal and it, 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 it I could see the difference weird. on my body. I could feel the way my body responded to the food. Like it was really really weird what was your line like you know once you got down when, when did it start to feel like oh, okay here we go like what, what percentage you six know? seven percent yeah right yeah. around there yeah and obviously becomes more dramatic as i got lower right so uh, you know the lowest i ever dunked or checked my body fat percentage was two weeks before a show um it was going into the national show uh i was i was 3.2 percent yeah, that's crazy with two weeks to go and the final two weeks is a pretty hard cut so i imagine i, I got another percent down or so maybe more uh the final two weeks and so everything is you know you feel every little thing that you do drink eat all that um when you get that low but I, I started it yeah oh yeah even you miss a little sleep and you're like oh that's great it looks like i gained another half percent body fat which you can tell when you're that lean it's really weird I think it's important too, before we get into this, that um, th this isn't like something you you should pursue if you're still dealing with, and most people are, relationship issues with food, relationship issues with exercise, um, because y y you'll create a crazy rebound. Even if you are, even if you do accomplish this and you don't have those things dialed in, you're going to rebound in a very negative way. Well, this is why we way. don't recommend competing for most people. I mean, yes. I get uh, so many people yeah. that ask it's me questions. It's performance driven. Yeah, totally. I just, it's, it, you, you need to have that. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I got into this, the, the sport of, you know, bodybuilding when I was 30 and I'd already been a trainer for 10 years. Oh, good point. And yes. so I, I had already worked through a lot of my insecurities around food and exercise and the way I look, my body image issues, like, so I think that's so important that you've kind of worked through all that stuff before you go do something at the competitive level. Even if you're not getting on stage, I think dieting to this level is competitive. Yes. So, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy around and, and, and calling be bodybuilding a sport or not, but the, the I, when I think of it as a sport, I think of just the competitive nature of what you're doing. You're, you're pushing your body beyond healthy limits, which is kind of all sports, right? Yes. You, you, you are always, you're pushing those boundaries of what can my, what can my body do when I push it to the ultimate level? Totally. Healthy is, is balanced. Uh, extreme is never balanced. I don't care what category that you, you come up with extreme, anything you're trading in longevity and health and balance for extreme performance. And I think there's value in that in many cases, but you got to identify if it's right for you and if it's going to result in way worse outcomes. You know, one of the first things I think that's important to understand when you do this is that you have to go into it recognizing that it's temporary. 
Now, why is this important? Because if you don't, because I've seen this many times, people get will get shredded and then they're obsessively shredded forever or they try to stay there forever. If that's you, you will suffer the consequences. The negative health consequences can be quite nasty in men and women from hormonal issues to immune issues. You can start to see some really, really bad health issues from trying to maintain a shredded physique. So you have to go into it saying, my goal is to get this lean, but it's going to be temporary. And then what that does is also allows you to come up with a back out plan. How do well, I back out of that? That's the part that I think is, so that, that is something I learned the hard way. Mm. So I was so obsessed with the competitive side at, of getting lean and the show and everything that I actually wasn't thinking about a backup plan. Like, okay, when the show is over, like I wasn't even thinking about that yet. And even I, when I got out of the show, knowing better, um, binged that yeah. first time. The first time, like, you know, because I did it, right? I made the show. And I'm like, oh, I got down. Celebrate. This, yeah, I was celebrating. And I was so low calorie. I was so lean. It was easy to justify all the junk and all the calories that I was taking on. After. And it's it's uh it can be deceiving because, I mean, I'm eating garbage the next 24 to 48 hours. And I'm looking better by the hour. Because I was so depleted. And so you start to kind of play this game like, oh, I can get away with this. Like, yeah. it's okay. And then before you know it, you've you've done a week or two of eating like this and the body fat. And we did an episode with Lane Norton a, a, a couple of years ago where we talked about when you do this, this is when your your body adds fat cells at like a, a rapid rate. Dude, so it's really dangerous to do that. This is a very important point to make. So, And I've I, by the way, I've witnessed female competitors gain 20 pounds in under a month. These are tiny girls. I've seen guys gain 30 pounds in a month from this rebound. So your body doesn't add the number of fat cells except for a few times in your life. Puberty, uh, I believe the third trimester of pregnancy can do this. But otherwise, generally, you get this number of fat cells and then they stick around. And then what happens is the fat cells either grow or shrink depending on if you eat more calories than you burn and, or you eat less calories than you burn. However, it's been observed, and this is what you're, what you're referring to, when people do extreme dieting where their body is like, because make no mistake, you get down to single digit body fat, it's starving. Your body's like, we're starving right now, okay? You get down that lean, your body turns into something different. And then when you refeed so much with excessive calories, your body has to, it adapts by improving its ability to capture calories. Right. And the way it does so, and we've observed this now in studies, is it adds the number of fat cells. What does that mean? That means the next time you try to get lean, it's harder. So in the only like uh, community I think we could point to where we could see this happening is the extreme bodybuilding and physique competitor um, category of, of athletes where you'll see them competing and then they'll talk about how th it's harder for them to get sharp. Like I can't get sharp like I used to. And you know I used to be able to get, you know this worked for me before, but it's not working again. And why is my body not responding the way it used to? Your, your body's literally learning how to capture energy more efficiently and by adding fat cells. So you can cause yourself a lot of problems by doing this, not to mention um, just the health issues. Because the first time I did that, where I got down to like 4%, I think it was, and then I did the same thing. Oh, it wrecked me, my gut. It really wrecked my gut. I went and ate a bunch of food. And I well, was like sick for And I imagine days. the same thing happened to you just instead of it being on the the, the physical like or visual side, you probably felt okay. Yeah. You probably were so depleted that you probably were eating foods oh, that normally my, would bother you and you're like, oh, I'm okay right after now. After my gut healed, I was like, oh, I think I'm, and I kept pushing it and then it, it just, it's not good. So you have to have that back out plan, but part of that is recognizing this is temporary. So, you know, for me, I like to walk around if I'm going to stay lean around 10%, okay? So if I get down to 4%, then what I'll do is I'll give myself a month or two to allow myself to creep back up to to ten percent. So it's kind of a slow crawl, instead of being like, let's see how fast I can get this weight back on my body. Now, knowing you guys have both kind of gone through this process, I know this isn't on the list or anything, but in terms of like uh, getting down as low as you possibly can, like uh, have the first attempt that you did. Uh, did you notice that? Um, I mean, you lost a good amount of muscle with it. Like you just we're just dieting Dude. as hard as possible, yeah. just mentally, like you're, you're trying your, your best to just like really cut calories, but maybe didn't do as good a job at preserving That's, muscle. The name of the game is, uh, is keeping muscle. It's not burning body fat. Cause you know what happens to a lot of people is they'll get down to like, you'll get a female that'll get down to 18 or 17% successfully. A guy gets down to 9% 
but then they keep pushing. They lose weight on the scale, but their body fat percentage doesn't budge anymore. And they're like, what's going on? I've lost another five pounds. It's because you lost muscle and fat. Uh, because right now what you're happening is you're just making yourself smaller. You see this happen at higher body fat percentages too, but when you get lean, the leaner you get, the more your body is trying to figure out a way to survive off these fewer calories. Yes, and one of the ways it does- to find that energy. Yeah, and one of the ways it does is it pairs muscle down. So the name of the game is can I, I got to keep this muscle at all costs. Otherwise, it's uh, forget it. That's a really good question, Justin, because um, I'm guilty of that even though I knew better. Right. So I would, I was so, so going into my very first show, I was so nervous to show up with extra body fat that I was like willing mm. to sacrifice potentially the muscle, which I'm sure some people get that in yeah. their head also. Like I, I wanted to be so lean that, uh, and I didn't want the, the day to come or the, even the week leading up and go, Oh my God, I, I haven't leaned out enough. And everybody was telling me up to that point that when you get on stage like that, like what will be, what will be more important than me having five or 10 more pounds of muscle that is that I'm two to 3% lower in body fat. So I probably took that and went too obsessive in the cutting the mm -hmm. very first show. Which I mean, I did okay. I, I placed in the top five, but I didn't. That wasn't my first show that I won. It wasn't until I started to kind of calm down a little bit. I and it took that first time of really dieting the extreme to know what I could do. I mean, I had never, I'd never dieted like that. And so part of this too is like learning the timing and like, oh, when I move these levers, my my body does this or it takes this long to react. And so that was a, a bit challenging for me the very first time. But I, I think after that first show. Um, I learned a lot of lessons. One was the re reversing out one. Two, what you're saying right now with like pushing that hard when I really didn't need to and probably sacrificing muscle when I didn't need to, you know, so which probably fed into the bad rebound so bad yeah. too. I mean, I, I cut so hard that I pushed calories lower than I needed to. I probably lost some muscle. So I inevitably slowed my metabolism down. And then I went the reverse and went, you know, yep. gangbusters on food afterwards and then put on a lot of body yeah. fat. I would say one of the biggest differences, and here's how, it, here's a, a, you know, one of the ways that this can be unhealthy long-term is when you're getting to single digit body fat, uh, you're not just consistent, you're obsessively consistent. So, you know, most people, you know, most guys can get down to, you know, 10% body fat and most women can get down to 18% body fat, which both are lean, both look great, by the way. Uh, most people want to look that way and that's still very lean, but most people can do that by being consistent. I don't know, 85% of the time, right? 85% of the time, you're consistent. The other 15% of the time, you're not going way off the rails, but you have some balance in your life, okay? To get down to single-digit body fat, you got to be consistent 100% of the time. Yeah. Like, not one meal. Full-time commitment. Not one bag of chips. Not two cookies. Like, I mean, and yes, you could try to make up for it with other things, but good luck trying to play that game. You have to be obsessively, ridiculously consistent. And I, I remember this the first time I did this where I was trying to get below 6%, and I couldn't. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And really, it was just oh, I have to do, I have to be perfect all the yeah. time, and then and then the extra one two percent, yeah, no flexibility at all, none, well, and it's psychologically not a great place. Well, to think be of like it like a like an you know archery target, and the outside is like fifteen plus percent yeah. body fat, then it goes to ten percent body fat, and then it goes to you know sub seven percent body fat, then sub five percent body fat, and then three percent or lower is yeah. the bullseye, and then think of you trying to shoot at that. You know, if you're if you just needed it to be you land your body fat percentage around fifteen to twenty, I mean, you could be a little a little off yeah, yeah. and and still land somewhere on the target. But if you're trying to hit that that single digit body fat, oh, the or smallest low, degree, this, yeah, the, the the tiniest bit you being off, and you're you're going to be, and that's what it's like dieting for that is you have to be so down. Which is I always have that conversation with clients that say they want this look, and it's like, do do you really because the the sacrifice the relentless commitment that it's going to take to get to that, you know, and it's unfortunate because we, we use this for advertising and we celebrate these I'm bodies. I'm so glad you said this. We glorify yep. this unhealthy, unbalanced, That's right. shredded. And, and it's, it is unfortunate and it's, and it's appealing, right? It looks amazing. It looks cool, right? So, so many people think they want that, but they don't recognize the obsessiveness that it takes to kind of get to that level and the amount of sacrifice that you, you have to, you have to do to get there. Yeah. And, and really, if you do the math to go from 5% to 6% body fat is less body fat than to go from 10% to 11%. Okay. It's less pounds of body fat. So to go from 
5% to 6%, it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit off, a little bit of a surplus that then that you didn't have. Ooh, I went up a percent. Like you can get away with way more at higher body fat percentages uh, with that. And, and, and the reverse too, you get a man at 20% body fat, he goes to 19% body fat, you can't tell. You go from five to four and it looks really different, you know? So you have to be obsessively, obsessively consistent and that is just not healthy long-term. You don't want to live there. But in the short term, understand that. All right, this is my goal. I want to do this. I have to. And I think there's benefit, again, for the right people to learn to have that kind of discipline, regardless of what, if, if, whether it's business or fitness or sports, mm -hmm. to be able to be, you know, that kind of dogged consistency. Well, that's, I mean, I, that's another one of my favorite parts about doing that is I, I think that there's a lot of parallels in, in other aspects of your life. And I think a lot of reasons why people fail at business, I think a lot of reasons why people fail at reaching certain goals is they just don't have the tenacity and consistency yeah. in, in what they do. A lot of people attempting almost anything that's hard, do it for a while, you know, fall down a couple times and then that's it. Yep. And this is one of those examples of like, you just have to be, you know, just relentless and consistent. And just most people don't have the gumption to stick with it. Now, I know there's people out there, the IIFYM crowd, right? The If it fits your macros crowd says, no, 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 you don't have to be obsessive. Um, you can be flexible with your diet. No, no, no. You're still obsessive with your calories, your proteins, fats, and carbs, even in that. So yeah. if you're getting down to, to single digit body fat, even if you do an I, I, F, uh, Y, M approach, which I don't, which I don't, um, encourage even for this, I don't encourage because good luck swinging and, and having these different foods and not messing with your hunger and your <laughs> mess of your craving oh, and yeah. ramping everything up. Oh, forget it. Like if I could fit a pop tart into my diet and make the macros count, I still wouldn't because that pop tart would literally screw me up for two days. And that's another thing too. If I eat something that is palatable in that way, I, my cravings are ramped up for 24 hours at least, and it makes it much more challenging. But e but even that, that crowd, you still have to be obsessively consistent. They still have to hit their perfect numbers of macros every single day. Um, all right, here's the next one. You'll notice a lot of bodybuilders and competitors will do carb cycling with their diet. Now, on, the, on its face, if your calories are the same and your protein is good and consistent, you know, do you need to cycle carbs? No, you, you don't necessarily. But here's why it works psychologically. First off, proteins and fats are essential, meaning you have to consume them um, in order to survive. And because your calories are so low, I don't like cutting the ones out that are essential. I like to cut the ones out that are non-essential because I can get away with being too low on them. I can't get away with being too low on protein or fat. Then my health really starts to decline and then forget everything, right? So that's why I like cycling carbs. Also, psychologically, when you get really lean, carb cycling allows you to have periods of more energy and better pumps because otherwise you just feel like crap all the time. So I give myself, and I, I, I'll, I'll balance out the calories with this, but I give myself some days where my carbohydrates are higher and that gives me those better workouts and it keeps me in the game. Otherwise, it's like this grueling uh, why am I doing this? And my workouts, uh, you know, kind of suck. I I never carb cycled until until it came time to get ready for a show. That was the first time I ever <clears throat> even messed with that, and I actually fell in love with the the process of of utilizing that as a tool. Um, I think for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the energy going into a workout, right? I can manipulate like, oh, I've got a leg day tomorrow, yeah. so I'm going to try and time it with loading my my carbs up. Also, the psychological part of not every day being exactly the same. It's like I have some days where, oh, wow, I get to- You start to look forward to it. Yeah. So you just base it on your movement for the most part with your uh, carb intake? Well, you know, more like on a calorie, really all you're really manipulating is calories, like Sal's yeah. saying. It's like, yeah. so, so over the course of a, a week, I let's say my goal is to have my calories at 2,200 calories, but I'm going to have some days where I'm having 2,700 calories. Some at 19. Uh, yeah, some at, yeah. So, and, and really the way I'm manipulating those calories is through carbohydrate right. intake. And the other reason why I really like it is because when you when you get really consistent with figuring out what your body needs protein and fat wise, like th it's a little bit harder to come by and to get after that than it is carbohydrates. There's carbohydrates are so easy to come by and find. It's also really easily to manipulate up and down. So I like being very consistent mm -hmm. with my fat and protein sources and staying dialed in on that, making sure, okay, this meal's got this many ounces. Okay, I'm good there. Mm -hmm. And then the only thing that I'm really messing with, and a lot of times it's okay, so it's either white rice, sweet potato, yams, quinoa. These are like the go-to staple carbs that I'm using. And all I'm doing is going like, oh, on these days, I'm getting, every meal is getting a 
cup of rice. Mm -hmm. On these other deals, uh, other days I'm getting two cups of rice. On other days I'm skipping every meal and getting a no carb in that meal. You know, so it, I can easily keep it very consistent and just play with something that's very measurable, like like rice or sweet potato. And it just made it made the dieting aspect really consistent and easy for me. And then also not so you know laborious of the same thing it's all psychological video. right it really is yeah. because it does that for me too and then i go into my work like if i know okay tomorrow i'm gonna i want to try and hit it a little harder <clears throat> i've been feeling kind of flat let me have a higher carb day today so that tomorrow i go into it and have a better workout psychologically um that helps me out carbs also for me at least um well actually studies show this for most people they're just the least satiety inducing macronutrient meaning proteins and fats will will make you feel more satisfied for longer than carbohydrates will. So, um, you know, bumping my carbs, even though my calories go up, I notice my appetite goes up. Even though it's a higher calorie day, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm starting to go hungry. And going low calorie all the time, you know, or being consistent, like you said, feels laborious. It's psychologically laborious. Having these ups and downs, like, oh, today's a low calorie day. I could deal with that knowing that in two days, I have right. a higher calorie day with, with more carbohydrates. Um, the next one is... You got to keep your protein intake high. Like high protein is important for most goals. It helps with fat loss. It helps with muscle building. It's great for satiety. This becomes really important when you're playing this game because the game is don't lose muscle. And yeah, studies will show this. muscle as much as possible. Oh, when they control calories, protein intake's high, even though the calories are the same, you lose less muscle. It also helps a lot with satiety. A lot. Like if my protein intake, if I eat 2,000 calories on this day and 2,000 calories on this day, but this day is 220 grams of protein, this day is 120 grams of protein, I guarantee you, even though the calories are the same, the 120 gram protein day, I'm way hungrier. Well, the extreme version of uh, being the carnivore diet, I experienced that in terms of like the calories being so much lower and it was easy for me to maintain for the most part. So, uh, you know, that strategy of like intaking a lot more protein will help. I I'm assuming in this big time you know, direction. Well, I just think too, that in general, like most clients, uh, under consume protein, not talking about the bodybuilders and the people that like over consume, which is a very small percentage of people. Most people don't consume enough protein as is. And then they're going into a diet where they're trying to get shredded and they're just cutting calories. What ends up happening is they go super low on protein yep. also. I imagine we just had this conversation last night, Katrina and I, I told you guys, she's, she's kind of dialing everything in. The very first thing I told her to do was to pick up her intensity on her training and make sure you are tracking your protein, your protein. Yeah. We're sitting there. Okay. Last night we're watching a movie. She decided to uh, have a, 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 one of those like, you know, hundred calorie popcorn snacks or whatever. And she's snacking on it and she's inputting her food and she's like, shit. She's like, I missed my protein intake by 20 grams. So what you should have done is not had that bowl of, of, of that popcorn. You should have got one of our protein bars that we have in, in the closet that has 20 grams of protein. And yes. that should have been your snack and choice. Now, from a calorie perspective, Same. she's okay. Yeah, She's not going to put on body fat from there. And it may help her drop a little bit on the scale still. But then she also missed her protein. She starts to string enough of those days together. And your body will start to pare down muscle because it's mm -hmm. not being fed what it needs to sustain it. This is very common when people are cutting. Yes. So is making this mistake of not being dialed in and tracking their protein while they're also in a deficit. And then at the end of their, oh, I lost my 20 pounds, and they find out that 10 of it was muscle and 10 of it was fat, they're like, what the fuck? Well, that's why, because you were so co concentrated on cutting that you weren't paying attention to your protein. Yeah, intake. I mean, along those lines, like I just had breakfast right now. What did I have? Steak and eggs and nothing else, right? Why? Because that keeps me satisfied. Otherwise, yeah. I'm sitting here podcasting. And I'm thinking about food and miserable. Yeah. So it really is satiating. Now, if I had the same amount of calories, but less protein and I had, you know, sourdough bread and fruit. Well, no, I love that you brought that up because what most people would do right there is, okay. So, and that was probably, I don't know, a 400, 500 calorie yeah. meal for you. Okay. Somebody else, and you're big, so it's just not a good example, but let's say you, you have half of that for a female, sure. right? 200 something calories, but it's all coming from eggs and steak. The common choice for somebody at breakfast is like a thing of oatmeal, yeah, which is you know lean and it's got lots of fiber, and so we talk about all the the benefits of it, but then it's all carbohydrate, mm -hmm. and then now the rest of the day you're trying to play catch up on the yeah. protein. So I that that's why I love a meal like that. Like one of my favorite things to recommend to people for you know especially in this case where we're dieting and we're is saving the because everybody seems to do fine with making uh, meat as the primary you know part of your 
dinner yeah. is saving that to carry over into breakfast. And I don't know if that's where you got yours or not, but that's like a staple move for Throw me. Throw that is in that, your scramble. Yeah. So like last night we had, we had bison and Brussels sprouts. Like I'm not dieting right now. If I was dieting though, that would be the start breakfast. It would be like bison and eggs. Yes. I would just take some of the bison and then I would have one or two eggs with it. And now that becomes my breakfast. Now I kickstart my day with 40 grams of protein right out the gates and it's low carbohydrate and not a lot of calories. So I'm in my, you know, staying low on my calories, but I'm also being mindful of making sure my protein yes is also high. working with nutrisense right so this is a, a glucose a continual glucose monitor company you you wear this device it measures your glucose levels throughout the day you work with the nutritionist the whole deal see how your body responds the number one way that you control your blood glucose from spiking and dropping but and you don't want that right because when it spikes and then drops that typically triggers hunger right away because your body's like oh gl blood sugar's low get hungry one of the number one ways that they see in all people helping to flatten that out is to eat your protein first. Ha you're going to have your meal, fine. Eat your protein, wait 10 minutes, and then eat something else. Yeah. It flattens it out. So a high-protein meal controls hunger through many different mechanisms. One of them is controlling that, that glucose, you know, those ups and downs. All right, so the next one, um, this one I think is really important because when people get into this, like, I got to get shredded phase, they start to turn – all their workouts into calorie burning yeah. workout, or at least that's the mentality. Yeah. They want to burn everything now on top of also like cutting down instead of like, you know, really preserving uh, what muscle they have by, by strength training, which is a completely different uh, protocol. Yeah. Lift weights. And your goal is still to try to build muscle. Now, are you going to build muscle going from 9% to 6% body fat? No, you're not. You're probably not going to go down, get stronger and build muscle. But the better you train in that direction, the less likely you are to lose muscle, which again, that's the name of the game. So you want to lift weights for strength and for muscle. That's the goal. And remember, uh, weights are phenomenal at doing that. Now you use weights, you can do conditioning, you can do performance, that's totally fine. But when we're talking about getting shredded, you want that muscle building signal to be effective because the more your body believes that it needs the muscle, the less likely it is to pare it down. Because what right now what your body's doing is it's weighing things out. Like, oh, um, energy intake is very low. We're running out of fat stores. That's your body's insurance. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need, imagine if your brain, your body had like these, you know, workers in there. Like, all right, everybody, you're having a meeting. Look, energy's low. Stores are low. Just like if you're, you lose your job and you have very little money in, this, in your savings account, what do you do? We need to spend less money. So your body's like, we need to pare muscle down. We need to make sure that we're not burning as many calories. But then someone speaks up and says, hey, hey hold on a second. But we need this muscle really bad. Just like if you're cutting your bills down and you're like, listen, you tell your wife, listen, we got to cut our expenses. And your wife goes, these are Tommy's medical bills. Like we can't cut these right now. We need this really bad. You're like, okay, well, let's let's keep going. So you have to send that signal effectively. So you have to lift weights and tell your body, build muscle, build strength. It takes it takes a lot of mental discipline, though. This, this is something Katrina and I were also having a conversation about. I said, you know, we want to uh, diet like we're trying to lose, but I want you to lift as if we were trying to gain, mm -hmm. right? So I want the intensity there. I want us to be focused on strength. You're trying to get stronger. But the reality is I know that I have you in a caloric deficit, and you're probably not going to get stronger. In fact, you may see your, your strength decrease. So here's where the mental challenge is, yeah. is that – you, you know you're going into the workouts with the attitude of, I'm trying to get stronger. So the lifting intensity mm -hmm. is there. You're trying to push the weight. You're trying to be strong. But I also know that I'm not fueling my body you know adequate calories to gain. Mm -hmm. So then what ends up happening a lot of times is you see the bench press decrease. You see the deadlift go down. You see the squat go down. And that tends to fuck with people mentally. But you just got to know that and accept it. It's okay. It's just, it's okay that I'm not going to be at my peak strength, but this is what's good for optimal results for me. This Sending that signal to your point, Sal, is going to hang on to all that muscle that I worked so hard to build, but I don't want to get caught in the trap of expecting that, oh, I'm lifting this way, therefore I should feel like I'm getting or get stronger every yeah, week. Yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of my strategy just because I think this, help, this will help, right? So what I try to do <laughs> is I try to, to time all my best muscle building, you know, techniques right when I'm hitting this point with my diet and nutrition, because I'm really trying to be as uh, effective as possible at preventing muscle loss. So what do I do? This is when I change the phase of my training, because I know that that novelty sends a better muscle building signal. Also, I time it so that the phase that I go into, the changing of my workout signaling 
also coincides with the kind, the phase of training that I know my body tends to respond to best anyway. So for me personally, if you have any of our MAPS programs, MAPS Anabolic Phase 1, okay, that's a strength, low rep, you know, you're doing fewer exercises, lots of sets per exercise, you're really focusing on these gross motor movements. For me, if all things being equal, okay, all phases being novel, all that stuff, I build the most in that phase. Now, for you, it may be, you know, 8 to 12 reps, it may be supersets, whatever. Save that phase for when you go into this. For me, I literally waited. And now what am I doing right now? Three full body workouts. I'm going, my reps are five, four, six, longer rest periods. Cause that's my best phase. And I saved it. I saved it to keep it novel to maximize muscle or to minimize muscle loss. So that's one tip you can do. So, so that's part of what I'm saying when I say lift weights for strength and muscle, change your phase so that you have something novel and save that style of training, the one that you respond best to for this period of time. I love that. And I'll take it a step further, right? So <clears throat> I, I typically train like a MAPS aesthetic, MAPS anabolic, uh, MAPS PED, all the all the bodybuilder stuff, right. right? That's what I fall in love with the most. Like I'm the op, Justin's more functional performance, that, that right. direction. I'm going to go the body sculpting type of direction. I know that's my MO. So when I switch to like a diet where I know this is, I'm playing this mental game, not only do I like to change the phase, I'll change the whole programming like to something like strong, which is something that is it's super novel. It's very different for me or even performance, right? These, it's got so many different exercises like a, uh, the the reverse lunge to a mind press like i have no i don't have a pr on that because i never did it long enough consistently to like get really really yeah. strong in it so i don't have this this preconceived number in my head that oh i'm weaker here i don't know like i have no idea That's what my point. my reverse lunge to a press on a on a landmine is i have no idea what my max zercher squat is mm -hmm. i have no idea what my max circus press is so i love switching to a a, a program that is so different than has so many exercises that i just normally don't really do that when I, so when i'm doing it and i'm probably weak because i'm low calorie i don't recognize it i don't go oh man man my circus press is normally 120 dumbbells and now i'm doing 60s this sucks it's like i don't even know what my best circus press is so i love to not only change the phase, but I love to even switch the programming up when I go into a really strict diet because then I don't have all these numbers. You, you, what you'll notice is, is a theme here, which is we're managing the psychological effects of this more yeah. than anything because that's the part that'll screw you up. To me, that's so, and that's yeah. what inspired this episode was that there. Yes, when we we are like trying to lose fifty pounds of body fat, uh, there's a lot of mental. In uh, mental games involved, but there's a lot of fundamental like, you know, macros and strength yeah. training and make sure you do this, make sure you do that. When you start to get really, really shredded, I think that like 90% of it becomes yeah. mental. Well, do you think that that's probably why your typical person when they're cutting down is uh, drawn more towards doing weights like a, a cardio version of weights like a um like a more circuit style yeah. training because it's like you get in sort of these rhythms when you're doing cardio where you're not as uh, you're doing a lot of reps but you're just having to get through it and sweat and so it's like it's less mentally taxing as you're going through. i think that's not what draws people to that i think what draws most people to that is they we are still so hung up on the calorie burn thing. yes well yeah and maximizing everything at once they yeah. think sweating yeah. equals fat loss yeah so and i and i think that what most people do is they they okay i've made this shift i'm cutting calories i want to burn yeah. and move and so they take that mindset into their weight training and so all of a sudden the pace picks up and they want to do circuits and they're i don't think they're thinking that logical like what you're alluding to i think it's just straight up i'm going to try and burn as much as i can yeah, and yeah. now they're they're doing longer workcouts they're adding things afterwards they're doing the battle ropes yeah. i'm you melting know. fat yeah that's no that's i, I we yeah. i think that's something that we get and you know we promote that stuff through all these fitness tools and trackers and yeah. you know uh, orange theories where you get you know bonus points for hitting the zone and like you know, i just think that that's we've 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 ingrained that in most people's minds that like oh you gotta burn eat less burn more you know the irony is yeah. that that those kind of workouts are effective for like two or three weeks yeah. that's yeah, it right like, yeah two or three weeks in fact that takes us to the next one which is avoid cardio until it's necessary. Oh, there you go. Save that tool. First of all, it's a short-lived tool, okay? Lots of cardio to get really shredded doesn't work very... In fact, a lot of people get shredded in spite of the fact that doing just tons of cardio for 12 weeks or whatever. Save it. Do everything with diet and strength training. 
And then the last couple weeks, if you want to throw it in, you can, and you can squeeze off a little bit of body fat. But if you make this part of your long-term routine, what you're doing is you're countering that muscle building signal that we're trying to do with strength training through this, I need endurance uh, type of a signal, which really only encourages the muscle pare down process. So what you want to do is you want to save it until absolutely. And I remember you, Adam, when you competed, I think you did it the last two weeks. Yeah. Was it? The longest I've ever done cardio is four weeks. And most often it was two. So it, it's, uh, if you have a coach and they have you doing cardio for 12 weeks leading into a show, you should fire your coach. And that's going to piss off a lot of people. Oh boy, most we're coaches, get some negative. Well, comments. most coaches, most coaches do that, and it's just a, it's a terrible. Yeah, they typically go from thirty minutes a day to sixty minutes a day to ninety. Yeah, they just a keep day. ramping it up and ramping it up, <laughs> ramping it up. And and by the way, it goes all the way back to the very first point that you made about having a plan when you come out of it. Talk about fucking your person completely. Oh my god, oh, yeah. you've now got this person adapted to doing you know five to seven hours of this cardio on the Stairmaster every single day and starving their body to 1,500 calories, they're not going to maintain that unless you absolutely love the Stairmaster. It'll take you three months to back out of the cardio alone. Yeah, no. Not to mention the calories. Exactly. So, and not only that too, like I want to teach my client. So if we're, if we're getting shredded, right? And I, I want to teach them how can we manipulate your, your calories to lean out without us messing with yeah. any additional cal calorie burn like cardio first. That doesn't mean we won't use it, but let's first figure that out. Can we manipulate that? And here's the thing. If you're at a place metabolism wise, where reducing your calories by 200 to 500 calories, it, it puts you in an unhealthy place calorie wise. You have no business trying to get shredded. Oh, what a great point. What a great point. No like, business. Yeah. I will not. So like, you know, I'm a uh, right now I weigh about, I don't know, 210 maybe. I'm, I wouldn't do this if my calories ended up below, you know, 2,300 calories, 2,400 calories. I wouldn't do this. That's going to be way too low for me. For, I've seen women at 800 calories as, on top of all the that's training crazy. that they're doing. Well, I've seen guys at 1,500 and, and, the, and the reason why that is is because they, they make this decision, whether it be getting ready for a show or they just want to get shredded for the summer, that they want to get shredded and they haven't first built a healthy metabolism. Mm -hmm. And their metabolism is at a place where... 1800 calories maintains where they're at and then they want to get shredded and the move for that person is not start cutting add cardio right there it's we need to build the metabolism up so that when we do start to calorie restrict you're still in a, a healthy place yes. halfway through this cut so that i mean and i get these dms all the time for people that you know want to oh this is what my coach has got me doing and it's like Man, if you're if you're 12 weeks out from your yeah, show do the math. and you're already sub 2000 calories already you have no business doing a show you should first work on building a healthy metabolism before you even, and show or body fat. I know I keep saying show because I know there's a lot of people who are listening that don't care about a show or get shredded. You have no business trying to get shredded, single digit body fat, or get ready for a show if you're at a place where you're 12 weeks or more out and you're already having to cut less than 2,000, 1,800 calories. That's way too fucking yeah, low, you're gonna, way you're, too soon. You're setting yourself up for some really, really bad failure later on. Yeah, a yeah. nasty rebound at the, the the best you could hope for is a nasty rebound, but you could end up fucking, horm fucking you up hormonally yeah. or really slowing the metabolism down and screwing yourself long-term. Yeah, it, it, I've, I've worked with people where it's taken us six months, a year to get them to recover from this process. Like, you, you know, you don't want to put yourself in that situation so you could look shredded for a week, right? It's not, yeah. it's not worth it. Um, and e that's if you can get to that point of looking shredded. A lot of people end up doing this and end up just getting smaller, losing muscle along the process. So, all right, here's the next one. And this one is an interesting one because all of us deal with cravings, okay? So cravings are usually motivated or driven by emotion or context, you know, I'm out with my friends or I'm happy or I'm anxious or I'm sad. So I crave or I'm bored, right? So I have these cravings. And then there's hunger. Hunger is totally different. And hunger feels it's much more, it's with you all the time. <laughs> it's much stronger. It's a more primitive driving feeling. And if you've ever done a fast for like 48 or 72 hours, you know what that feels like. It's very yeah. different from cravings. Like here's the difference. Cravings is this. Justin and I are about to go to lunch. Justin's like, hey, what do you want to have for lunch? Uh, you know, uh, Mexican food. No, I'm not really in the mood for me. Oh, what about pizza? Yeah, let's get pizza. Here's what hunger feels like. <laughs> you know what like. hunger looks like? Celery sticks. I don't hella good. I don't care. <laughs> I'm serious, that's if it. there's food, to me, that's how it. I describe it to someone. Like, you're not hungry if you're if you want a certain food. Oh, yeah. yeah. When you're hungry, 
everything sounds anything, good. Yeah. Anything yeah. that's I'd salty. Argue most people haven't ever experienced I agree. real right. hunger. And it's, yeah, and it's just because of that point. Like, if you haven't gone 48 hours, 72 hours without food, it's it's really hard to uh, compare the two. Yeah, if you, if you say, I'm hungry, I really want this, it's like, nah. If you're hungry, I'll you'll, take anything. Anything. <laughs> I'll take anything. anything. Even <laughs> foods you don't traditionally like. Yes. That's yep. so true. So here's what I'm about to say. When you start to get down to single-digit body fat, you got to learn to accept that you're going to live with hunger. It's mm. going to be, it's literally this thing that's with you all day long to the point where, you know, and I'm not quite there. I could feel it right now, but I know in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to feel it where you got to leave the room when there's certain kinds of foods or you, you get mad at your partner. Why <laughs> did you open that in front of me? Don't yeah. eat that next to me. Like it's really weird. And it's very, again, it's an unhealthy uh, place to be. That's why you don't want to live in this space, but you have to accept that you're going to kind of feel uncomfortable um, most of the time, like when you're sleeping, I, I don't, okay. Cravings. Well, maybe people have cravings like this. It never happened to me where I wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I don't think, Oh man, I want to go downstairs and get, it never happens to me until I get down to like seven, 6% body fat. I'll literally wake up, go to the bathroom and be like, man, I want to eat an apple right now. <laughs> you know, I want to go downstairs <laughs> yeah, to go eat, something. eat an yeah. apple right now, but you have to kind of learn to live with it. And there's a, there's a, a mental switch that has to occur. Well, like talking yeah. about hunger, uh, or, and, or cravings, um, one of the things that I didn't realize until pushing myself to this level was how much my sleep, uh, impacted this. Oh yeah. So I, I, I didn't, I never, uh, drew that conclusion of, Oh wow. It's fuel to the fire. Anytime man. I have like a, a really bad night's rest, whether it be restless all night or we like this would happen early on in mind pump. Cause I was competing during mind pump times. And then we were also doing stuff like we do like a live event or something. And my, my freaking energy was like on fire all day. I couldn't sleep. So two, three in the morning yeah. before I finally fall asleep and then back up the day. So terrible sleep, man, the next day, Oh, the, I just wanted everything bad, like junk food just sounded so good to me. And it took a few times of having those nights that were really bad sleep followed by those days. And what made me realize is because I was being so consistent during those times. This is again, another one of the benefits of being so dialed and so co consistent. You start to pick up on these things that if my, if my diet was like this all the time, it would be really hard to measure that and be like, Oh, was it because my bad night's sleep? Or am I just wanting the ice cream? Cause I had ice cream yesterday yeah. and now I'm craving it again. Or it's like, or is it because I have some sort of correlation with what I'm doing? And so it's really tough when you're inconsistent, but when you're so consistent with your diet, you start to pick up on these little subtle things. This was something that I had never noticed in my life until I got really consistent with the diet. And I was like, all of a sudden have a night like that and be like, that's so weird. I've had no problem eating these same meals for the last month, but now all of a sudden I want all this bad stuff. It's like, oh shit, totally. it's, it was the night's rest. And again, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're living with hunger all the time and these things will just ramp it up. And so now you got to really white knuckle it, you know, even more. But here's the other part of that. When you're getting to this, when you're getting this lean, you are stressing your body out. It's, this is another level of stress. And so if you, if your sleep is off, and your stress levels are high, your body, you you can very easily reach a point where your body can't deal with it. And then it'll backfire. And this is where you see people on their quest to getting shredded for either a competition or a photo shoot. Or maybe they're going to Vegas, who knows? And on their quest, and they get sick. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, I always get sick once I start to get lean. In fact, it's so common for people when they start to get to this point where they they get a cold or they get whatever. So you have to have your sleep. And your stress levels also be very well managed and consistent because you already are at that line. You don't have any room for any additional stress to tip your body over. It's way better to be antisocial at this point <laughs> <laughs> and just just really consider all those factors uh, that uh, you need to be as low stress as possible. You need to get that sleep. So if this is your priority, you have to create almost this bubble uh, that you have to just just stay in for. Yeah, while. and this is why I'm like, don't you don't want to live here? I don't understand how people. Can I don't live. know. It's, 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 I don't get it. It's but. such a dysfunctional way uh, of living all the time, and it's just you literally have no room. Yeah, you know who wants to live their life without having any room for any additional stress? Like life doesn't work that way, right? So unless you structure and plan your life to this bubble, like you said, in which case now what are you doing? You're cutting out social events. You're cutting out conversations you need to have with your spouse and yeah. you're disconnecting. But that's what from, it takes. To, yeah. So to, to get there, but yeah, you, you need to keep stress and sleep totally consistent and in check. All right, here's the next one. And I remember like in the first time I got down to really lean body fat percentage, just used to mess with me, which was, uh, water, water retention. 
Like if you hold a couple pounds of water and you're 11% body fat, nobody can tell. You get down to 5% body fat, you gain, you hold two or three pounds of water. It looks like you gain one, 2% of body fat. And that can really mess with your head. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to even challenge that, what you said about it being 11 or 15% and hold it. I, this is the, the single, I, I love this point of all the points we've made so far. This one, I think made me a better coach from competing, uh, to, uh, it took me to another level that, um, I didn't see coming either. And that was being able to communicate this to my clients that are even 25, 30% oh, body fat. because of fat. the scale. Because of yeah. this, because of the scale and even the mirror. Right, mm -hmm. like you, you, you get you know bloated from a meal that your body reacts to, or you intake you know x amount more sodium, or you know x amount more carbohydrates. For every three ounces of carbohydrates you take in, your body holds three ounces of water. So if you had a day where you're higher carb and you had a couple extra glasses of water, I mean, you could really look different in the mirror. Your scale could go up one or two pounds, and yet be perfect. I mean, you could be literally dialed the way I want you to be eating and training, mm -hmm. but yet see this go in the opposite direction than you think you want it to. And what happens is you 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 pivot and you change. You overcorrect. So, the, and the only reason why I figured this all out and can communicate was because I was so dialed. I was tracking it. I was doing the math. So I like, I know I'm sitting here going like, okay, I'm moving yeah, this water. Way. Yeah. Sodium. Yeah. I'm yeah. tracking everything. So I know that like I should be getting better and better and better every single day. Yeah. Sure. You have some slowdown and a little bit of plateaus, but I definitely shouldn't go worse to go the other direction. It just mathematically is impossible. I know what I'm doing. And I would actually have these days where all of a sudden I go up and then I'd be like, what? Scratching my head. And the only thing that made sense was like, and that's how I, that's how I learned like how many, how much water pairs with carbohydrates and sodium. And like I started like going in and like figuring out like, why is this, why is this happening to me? I'm dialed. This shouldn't be happening to me. But then it opened my eyes like, oh my God, how often did this happen? I wish I had this information when I was a trainer in my twenties, because how many times did I put a client on a diet? And them, them following it supposedly to a T and then them come back to me and they freak out because the scale went up a couple pounds. Yeah. And then me going, even as a trainer going, oh shit, it shouldn't be going up. Okay, well then let's uh, let's cut this out then or let's, let's pick up some cardio 30 minutes and actually being a bad coach and adjusting because I see this little bit of a water fluctuation, not knowing better. So th this is of all the things that I learned going through competing, like this was one of my favorite things that I took away from it because it, it has given me the tools to communicate that to clients, even at a higher body fat percentage that may not, and to your point, I know what you're making. Like it's not a huge difference. It's a huge difference at 5%. You're at 5% body fat and you hold a pound or two. I mean, that's the reason you why. You look so different. Yeah, you look different. I mean, you could lose a show because of that. Yeah. If, I, if I don't go in with just the right amount of water in my body, right, enough to fill the muscle bellies up, but not enough to like get in the subcutaneous and then make me look all puffy looking, like that will lose a show. I'll lose places in a show. So mm -hmm. it's that, it'd be that dial, but somebody at 13, 14%, maybe not so much, but even them will see a little bit of a difference or see the scale. Yes. yes. And speak, speaking of scale, remember that the scale lies because when you're trying to get leaner, obviously the goal is to get the scale number to go down, but I've gotten leaner with the scale number going up in the past, like where I was over dieting, over training. I changed things a little bit. I saw myself go up two or three pounds on the scale over the course of three, four weeks. Do my, I look in the mirror. I'm like, man, I look way leaner. How the hell am I heavier? Get a body fat test. And I'm like, I did get leaner. Why? Because I gained a couple pounds of muscle, you know, gaining muscle and keeping the total pounds of body fat on your body. The same means your body fat percentage went down, right? If you gain 10 pounds of muscle and on your body, you always had 30 pounds of body fat. So, and that didn't change. That stayed 30 pounds of body fat, but you gain 10 pounds of muscle. That 30 pounds of body fat is a smaller percentage of your total body weight. I also think it's one of the, the healthiest and best places you can be metabolically when you're in a, when you're trying to lose body yeah. fat. If I can, which is, is always the goal for me for somebody who's trying to lose weight, whether we're trying to lose 30 to 40 pounds or we're just trying to shred down the last five or 10, I would love to see us kind of stay the same on the scale yeah. for as long as we can. Like, so obviously at some someone, point, yeah. yeah, somebody has to lose 50, a hundred pounds. The scale is eventually going to come down. But to be honest, I actually don't want to see that initially. I want to see us kind of hover around the scale weight, but I know that if we're feeding ourselves properly, we're strength training, we're a little bit in a caloric deficit. Hopefully I'm having this beautiful exchange, right? Your body's got this new stimulus. So maybe it is stimulating a little bit of muscle growth. And then we're also in a calorie deficit. So I know we're losing body fat. So we have this nice little even exchange. It's a really good place to be metabolically versus 
you know, cutting the calories like crazy, moving the movement like crazy, and then also the scale goes down 10 pounds, you think because your ultimate goal is to lose 30, that's a good sign, but metabolically, it's not a good sign. Yeah, so I, I the scale is a tool, but you have to combine it with all the other metrics. So scale, performance, strength, photos. By the way, we didn't include this, but I like photos because uh, if, well, for me personally, because the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm going to be on camera. So it really doesn't matter what the numbers say. If I look better, I look better. And when you do that, make sure you take your pictures the same place, same lighting, same food, same time of day, whatever, oh. same thing in the mirror so you can see these subtle differences. I didn't, this wasn't on the list, but I think that's an important, you know, one way to track kind of how you're doing so you can put things kind of side to side. Circumference, you know, that'd be another one, but you want to add all this stuff to give yourself more of a complete picture. The scale by itself just tells you body weight. And, you know, if you got your leg amputated, your weight went down, but that's not the kind of weight you'd want to lose, right? Yeah. Um, all right, lastly, here's where supplements, supplements are not, super important, depending on the context or situation. They're never really that important. Whole natural foods is will, will do everything that you need. However, when you reduce your calories, you're also reducing your nutrient intake. When you're increasing your strength, you may actually be increasing your nutrient requirements. How do we make that work? I'm eating less calories, which means I'm getting less nutrients, but my nutrient require, requirements may be going up because I'm training more and I have a higher stress on my body supplements. This is where supplements can come and play a vital role, right? If I'm not getting enough of my B vitamins and, you know, my minerals because my food intake is so low and it's hard for me to manage everything on top of those micronutrients, well, now I could take a supplement and make up the difference. Uh, creatine, love creatine all the time. I really love it when my calories are down because when my calories are down, my, my meat intake is down too. Even though my protein's high, it's still lower than it is when I'm eating more calories, which means I'm getting less creatine from food. So then I introduce that creatine. Um, so this is where supplements, I think, can play an important role. And this is where I like to supplement with, you know, micronutrients to make sure. Well, I'm yeah, this is, I mean, what I need. I'm the most consistent with, I, we talked the other day, I don't know if that was off air or on air or not, but I was joking about how, like, I have to add that the pill bottle, right? That yeah, I have yeah. to have now just to do all the Dr. Cabral supplements and everything. I'm really, I'm actually really bad about being consistent about taking supplements. The most consistent I am is when I'm on like a really dramatic cut like this because I just know I'm like, obviously I'm cutting a ton of stuff out of my diet. The likelihood that I'm hitting all my micronutrient targets is probably not likely. And that's just one more thing that I think can benefit me and help me. And then the other thing that we just don't talk about as a supplement, but it is a supplement is a, a protein powder. Oh yeah. That's protein powder and bars. Like this is where convenient. Yeah. Easy. I mean, I was just talking about how Katrina, like this is an example of where, I mean, of course it would be great for her to go cook, you know, four and a half ounces of steak, yeah. at, but at 10 o'clock at night, we're watching TV and stuff like that. She's under on her protein mm -hmm. intake. She's snacking on a hundred calorie uh, popcorn. Instead of that, you should have had the protein bar or should have had a quick whey shake or something. Yeah. So here's where I use, that's where I really start to use that is when I'm cutting calories, I notice I, I already have a hard time hitting protein intake as it is. When I'm cutting calories, it's even harder. I look at the end of my, my day and that's kind of what decides what I'm going to do as my final meal slash snack, whatever you want to call that last thing that I consume before I go to bed is me adding up everything and going, oh, wow. You know, today, uh, either today I hit everything, so I'm cool. I don't have to eat anything, or I maybe I'll snack on some sn some nuts to give me a little bit of satiety and feel better before I go to bed. Or, oh shit, I'm low on protein here. I'm going to blend up a shake. Yeah, because in uh, with whole natural foods, it's it's hard to get just protein without other macronutrients. I mean, you can do it with egg whites and chicken breast, but then the convenience becomes an issue. And also, maybe it's not palatable. Protein shakes can be, I mean, they can be pretty tasty. At this point, they're tasty. Uh, when you're dieting like this, at this point, a shake is like a treat. Very easy protein. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. I like What I like to do is I like to have uh, lean sources of protein saved in the fridge. So like chicken breast shredded in the fridge. And what I do, I can throw salsa on it, which adds negligible amount of calories. And I can snack on that. But a shake is like exactly at the end of the day is for me too. It's like, okay, it's, you know, eight o'clock at night. I'm not going to go. I don't want to eat anything before bed. That's going to take more time to digest. I'll just throw on a shake and there's my extra 20 grams right. of protein. And it's got almost no carbohydrates and no fats. Now I know we didn't go into specifics about how to cut, you know, how many calories to cut, whatever the rules that apply to somebody who is going from a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%. So 20% is kind of high. 15% is pretty healthy. The rules that apply to that person are the same as the, the rules same. that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about. No, the, the reason why I think we did this episode, it was to highlight that 
the real thing that happens that's different right here is the mental game. Yes. The, the mental game gets way tougher, in my opinion, because there's a lot of things that are deceiving. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that take a lot more consistency, a discipline, sacrifice. Like That's really the only difference between getting to 10% and then getting down to like 3%. Totally. The, the same, like you said, the all the same rule apply for the person who is morbidly obese trying to get down as the person who is 10% getting down. Like the only difference is the psychological the, discipline. And the, and the ridiculous, unhealthy, consist, obsessive consistency uh, <laughs> yeah. with the whole thing. Look, if you like Mind Pump, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. You can find Adam on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam, and you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.